sleep last night for those who need the beauty rest. For some of you, it didn't work. Some, most of you look marvelous. <laughs> but Jerry, we're still praying for. <laughs> it's good to see you today. Many of you know that I've uh, been running back and forth to West Texas. I shared with you a couple weeks ago, you got the prayer request. My brother had a major cardiac event. Drove off the road, wrecked his truck. Uh, EMT got there pretty quick, started working on him. Had uh, 45 minutes that they worked to resuscitate him from the time they got to him to the emergency room and worked him in the emergency room trying to get a heartbeat. I also got the, the repair request out. Some events in the last few days have surprised everyone. But to just kind of take you back a little bit, you, most of you knew that. Last Sunday when we were here, I was at the other campus, in fact, in the morning when I got a phone call uh, that said uh, that they had decided to take my brother off all life support uh, at that moment, right after I finished service. In fact, I'd seen Kathy get him walk out of the service, somebody had given her a call, and then came up to me as we were dismissing guests, telling me what was going on. To say the least, I was a little irritated uh, because... I, I wasn't ready for that, one. Number two, I hadn't given my permission. You know I am. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, it had, had been done. I took him off life support with the vent machine. They took him with the breathing tubes, the saline drips, everything. Just disconnected. Doctors were saying uh, that uh, even though he still breathed, he might live a day or two. You know, evolution has so constructed our brain. Kind of showed you where I was right away with this doctor has so constructed our brain that the last event to go in our physical life is, uh, is, the, is the breathing. It's all control from the le- lower part of the brain, the upper brain stem, and all that part right there. Control, and so it's the last thing to die. So there, you know, the lights may be on, but it's not really home kind of thing. So you just need to let go. And, and you know, so I received that word. You know that right after the service Sunday, and some of you thought the service was short. It was intended to be short anyway. It was a Lord's Supper service and stuff. But... Uh, we were uh, in the car and gone, got out to San Angelo and, uh, uh, yeah, in about five hours. I mean, most of you know that that was all grace. Uh, <laughs> in more ways than one. Grace that there wasn't a police officer at every city I went through. But uh, got to the hospital, mom and them, she's here today, praise the Lord. And, uh, Received the news that they were moving to palliative care that, in, that night, that morning. And, you know, that, that basically means that they take everything, just put you on a morphine drop to, to help you if, you. if you're feeling any pain, you won't feel any pain, just to let you go. Uh, which several of us in the family were not happy about all this because we'd seen some responses. But evolution dictates <laughs> that, if the, that you can still have some autonomic responses to noise and sounds and voices and stuff. Uh, so, you know, we sh- you shouldn't put a lot of stock in that because, you know, things can still happen because you know, the evolution has so made our brains that the lower part of the stem of the brain, the, you know, and on. I think I heard that explanation how many times, four or five times from different and highly intelligent, qualified people. <laughs> Thus, we get the term for practicing medicine, by the way. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a science yet. We're still practicing. We got in the palliative care room with him that Monday afternoon and started just talking to him and playing music and, you know, where he could hear it and speaking to him still and encouraging him, you know. I, I, I told him, you know, if you're going to come out of this, you better do it now, you know. <laughs> There's no time for delay. You have officially been unplugged, you know, so get yourself out of this bed. And everybody was saying stuff to him. We were laughing and praising the Lord and singing and praying and everything else you can do during those times. Uh, I put on some old classic 50, 60 music beside his pillow just to see if he'd respond, you know. <laughs> Put your head on my shoulder. <laughs> to which his eyebrows went real high, you know. And I just told the nurse, I said, I know what these doctors told you and what we're supposed to do. I said, but, you know, we're seeing signs here, you know, that, that we're not through. Well, sir, I understand, you know. And she didn't, but she did a little later. In fact, as the, the, the this afternoon went on, we began more, we get some more response from him. Uh, we were talking to him, it'd be... You know, you know, I'm thinking I'm seeing these things, but I have to get everybody else to could verify it. You know, we, did, did, was that a yes or was that a no? Did he just shake his head? No, did when you asked him that question, no. Oh, well, maybe. You know, could be autonomic due to evolution. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
So we uh, went through that, and this, the longer the evening went, you know, finally I, you know, I, I, I said, you know, I just tried to explain to him what was going on. We were all encouraging him. I said, you know, Bill, you're not, you just going to ICU. You, uh, you had a heart attack because it seemed like he was, he's opened his eyes occasionally, and he'd done that some already. But this time it seemed to be like he was looking, whereas before it was just kind of a stare. And to try to walk through the process, you're probably really confused. Do you know who I am? Just nod yes or no. And he didn't nod yes or no. He just looked at me like, get out of my face kind of thing. Or I'm not sure who you are. Do you know who you are? Look on his face. I don't know. But <laughs> if you don't know who you are, go ask the nurse. She probably knows. Uh, anyway, uh, after I explained everything to him, there was a little phrase that came out that was more like an expletive that he didn't believe where he was in what I just told him. But first words he'd uttered, so I didn't care what they were. I mean, I was praising the Lord, that he uttered words. Everybody's shouting and freaking out, and we're all praising the Lord. You know, and of course, I'm trying to convince the nurse that we need to get off palliative care, stop the morphine drips, and finally, you know, she starts freaking out herself and realizes what's going on, and uh, we all kind of just been exhausted. We kind of left, so let's let him get some rest. I mean, we're seeing the change here. He's going to come out of this. He's starting to function. He's looking around the room. He's recognizing people. You can see his eyes. Where before they were just blank stare. Now he's moving his eyes back and forth. And all the signs that you want to see. Uh, in fact, as soon as I got in the car, his wife texted me and said, he just said to me, Linda, so his wife's name, I'm sick. I'm really sick. So I said, that's marvelous. You know, that's, that's a praise God. That's miraculous. So it was, it was a supernatural event, which no one in the medical field in that hospital thought was absolutely at all near even wishful, hopeful, or possible. It was a miracle. Amen. Amen. The most fun part of this miracle was watching the doctors. <laughs> Kathy and I think were the first ones up there that morning, and, and the doctor parade started along with some of the ER people and the ICU people parade started. This rumor that of this miraculous healing had started trickling through the office, you know, through the hospital. And, you know, wherever you went in the hospital, people were hearing about it. Uh, the first doctor that came in was the doctor that was in charge of his palliative care to help him die, basically. He came in, and he's, I think Camille or my other talked to him, and he told them or one of the family members, hey, I'm a believer. I want you to know I'm a believer, and I, I know miracles can happen. But he said that was kind of hopeful kind of thing. We don't want to discourage the family, you know. And he even admitted that later. You know, I, I say that, but he said, in fact, he came in, he was looking at Bill, and his mouth's open, and he's just kind of gaping at him. And he, who are you, and what day is it? And he tells him, you know, it's, what month is it? What year is 2013? What's your name? Tell his name. Who's the president? He says, oh, my Lord. He says, there's what I'm looking for. And, <laughs> Don't, don't get into politics. We don't want to go there. We're trying to have a healing here, you know. Because he's definitely politically inclined. But uh, the doctor said, he took his desk open and was here and listened to his heart. He said, oh, Lord. Put him behind, breathe deep. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. You know. And uh, he said, and he said, listen, he said, I'm, there's nothing but to call this but a miracle, Bill. I hope you realize. This, this, you've experienced a genuine miracle. There's no, there's no medical reasons why you ought to be talking while you ought to be breathing, while you ought to be sitting here communicating with me. He, said, he, just, he put his hand on his leg and just thought, hallelujah. <laughs> so what did you say? <laughs> he said, hallelujah. He said, he looked at, you know, he said, he said I got chill bumps. He said, doctor said, I got chill bumps from the top of my head to my, look here on my arms, look at the goosebumps. He said, this is a miracle. So he's freaking out. Of course, Kathy and I are just freaking out watching him freak out. <laughs> You know, I asked Kathy, did you get pictures of that? She says, no, I wished I had. I didn't think of it. I said, that had been some good video to have, you know, <laughs> just watching him freak out. Well, he leaves the room, and he says, the, the ICU doctor, Dr. Rushman, who kind of over saw your care, the one that basically said, unplug him, he's dead kind of thing, not really much hope here. He said, uh, he's off today, but I'm going to text him. I don't know if he'll come up. Well, he showed up, what, 20 minutes later. And you know, he comes up to the hospital and comes in and introduces himself as Dr. Jackass. Uh, <laughs> now, that's a biblical term, so don't freak out, all right? <laughs> He introduces himself in that format and says to Bill, says, you know, it's just, it's just, just, you know, it's just. And one of the doctors said, you know, but you have to realize that for every four minutes that your brain is without oxygen, you're, you, it dies by 10%. You were without oxygen for 45 minutes. That's 110%. It's a miracle that you're alive, much less that even if you are alive, you're not a vegetable. That you're talking, you're speaking, you recognize, you remember. It's, this is just supernatural. 
you know, and of course it wasn't the, the evolution Dr. Rushman guy who said that. He, he was just in awe. He, he basically said, I'm sorry. He said, you know, sometimes things just don't go what you think they're going to do. It was real hard for him to say it was a God thing. I never heard him admit it. But he came up and saw Bill, what, two or three different times before the next two or three days was gone. ICU nurses came in. The last doctor that came in was his cardiologist who came in, and his mouth was literally open. He came up, took his desk, go put him in his ear. Tried to be very doctorly. Uh, Mr. Arms, ask him a few questions. Is, did he, is he cognizant? Does he know what day it is? Do you know what his birthday is? Do you know where he is? All this stuff goes on, answers all those questions. He starts giving him the physical explanation of his heart attack. That went to, once he was brought in, as soon as they finished the resuscitation, they did put a stent in his heart. His heart was at about normal for that age. Or when you're 66, 67, your heart operates at really about 50% of its full function that it used to do when you were a young person. He said, your heart's at about 30%. You've had some damage. It may repair itself. It may not. But there's medicines you can take for all that kind of stuff. But he didn't get back and said, but hey, I have to be honest. I, I cannot believe I'm sitting here talking to you. I just, I, just, I just can't believe this. Of course, he had two assistants with him. They're in the corner just, you know, shouting and crying at the same time, watching him freak out, you know, with his mouth open between his sentences, like kind of thing, just in, in awe. So... Our family want to say to all of you who prayed and trusted and believed God, even when there was no evidence of seeing any answer to prayer, thank you for praying. And thank God for still moving in such a supernatural way. We have some way to go. He's still working on balance and all that kind of stuff. He was in your ICU in a coma for eight days. Your muscles have a tendency to atrophy. Getting all his balance back is going to be another deal, and he's worked through that. All his speech centers right. Reasoning areas are still working on some of that. I told him he was always partially brain dead anyway, so we should be excited <laughs> about any, anything that happens on his regard. I told Bill, I said, everybody in the hallway, I said, when you come by, you know, because I'd walk him. I mean, he's up walking two days after this. We're walking around the hospital, walking around the floor, trying to work on his balance and strength and everything. So all these people are smiling, I said, uh, uh, because you're a miracle. I hope you realize that. And... So I used to say I'm lucky, but I guess I was lucky. Was it? Was you were blessed. I said, and those who aren't smiling, those people that aren't smiling, they're thinking, oh, no, how many did we kill? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, how many did we let go before it was time? So I hope that your faith, as mine has been, has been encouraged by all this. And we continue to ask you to pray for him because there's just some areas that he's still going to have to work on and get right, but we've seen God do so much, we're expecting great and supernatural things to continue in that regard. But we appreciate your prayers. Amen? Amen. Somebody praise the Lord. That's, that's worth praising the Lord for. Let's get into our message today that we begin this new series. It's really connected to the last series that we did on apostasy. Uh, this is a long sermon, so I'm not going to give it all to you today, especially after giving you the testimony report. We'll kind of cut it into two pieces so we don't rush through it because there's so much here. We did, we did our last series of messages on uh, the apostasy, the end times, and it's really what would be happening in the spiritual realm or the religious circles uh, uh, in the days right before the Lord's return. And Jude wrote about it and Peter wrote about it. And we spent eight weeks talking about that. The next few weeks we're going to talk about moving up from that aspect of it to looking about signs of the times and events in the order that they are. And I think you can get that first slide there and then we'll go from there. But today we're talking about what time is it. And that's, that's the name of this particular series that we would know what time that we're living in. Obviously, the time is very late. Obviously, the time is, is uh, later than what most people think. But it, you have to understand that as you put all this together and you look at the last days, there are signs that we'll talk about in the Middle East. There's signs that we'll talk about as we have in religion. And there's signs that, that are happening in the, in the popular culture or the general philosophy of the world, the mindset of the world. And we're going to look at a lot of it. It's today when we focus on this Sunday and next Sunday on what is going on in the general culture of the world, the whole mindset of where the world is as a whole and, you know, and, and, and what's going to happen from there. Next Sunday, after these two messages, the following Sunday, we'll talk about and give you an overview 
of the last days where we'll talk about the different aspects of or the rapture, where is that, where's that, when does that kind of stuff take place, what's the difference between the rapture and the second coming, are they the same thing, we'll talk about the judgment seats, the Bema seat, the great white throne of judgment, the millennium, so we'll look at some of those things in an overview and then we'll deal with a few of them just specifically right before we get to Christmas, all right? So open your Bible with me since the overhead is not working in 2 Timothy chapter 3. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, the apostle is writing to Timothy and he's giving him uh, a clear picture of what these last days will be like. In fact, he tells him very specifically, in the last days, perilous times shall come. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy, excuse me. Second, thank you very much. Were you there this morning already? 2 Second Timothy chapter 3. Verses 1 through 5 is what we're going to, real, to, to look at. He says, New American Standard, but realize this, in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. Now, if you look at these passages, these few verses, it's just a little, it's like a photograph of the culture and the day which I believe is talking about this particular day that we live in. He says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. This is, this is the description. And there's about 17 terms that he uses in giving this description of how things look like in the last days. In fact, we just call it the description of the last days. In fact, these words, in the last days, days is this word here, it's translated in a couple of words, last days, is the word chronos. And, and, and if you look in a Greek dictionary, this word in the English means basically a space of time that designate, designates a fixed, special event or particular period, season, or space of time. In other words, what God is saying in this passage that he has fixed certain times and certain seasons it would do well for us to know what those seasons are. He rebuked the Pharisees when he told them, you can discern the skies. You know if it's going to rain tomorrow or not, but you, you don't really know what time it is. They didn't know that this was Messiah, the long-awaited for Prince of Peace, the Christ, in their midst. They missed the times. There's a passage in the Old Testament that talks about the men of Issachar said that they were wise men. They discerned or they understood the seasons. They understood the time that they were in. What we need to do as a church, as individual Christians, as the Christian culture as a whole, is to realize the season and the time, this chronos in which we have been brought to, that we live in and that we're a part of. All of our, our, even our logo in our church says for such a time as this. What is that time? It's this time. And this is that time that the scripture talks about. I believe these are the perilous days, the perilous season, this event of, the, of, 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 of history, which brings us to the, obviously the last days, but even more so the last days, the last days of the last days. He said, know this, that in the last days, difficult times. King James Version says, perilous times will come. The word is chalepos. It means fierce, perilous, difficult, hard days are going to be what, what, what marks those end days, those very last of last days. That's what it'll be like. Now, basically, when you look at this word in the original context of the Greek language, there's about three different meanings or three different ways that this word is used in the Greek language and in the Greek culture. One, it's used as a medical term, all right? It, it, the famous Greek writer Plutarch used this term to describe and, uh, this word as, as something that's an ugly, infected, or dangerous wound. So that you had some kind of mortal wound, it's dangerous, it's infected, it could cause your death. That's the word which the Holy Spirit uses to describe how difficult the last days are going to come. Now we know that in a, in a real sense, when you look in Matthew 24 and other places, Jesus talked about that the last days would be filled with plagues and famines and sickness and disease. Now, I, I'm not going to go into all of that today, but this world has never been so plagued. 
even with all the modern medicine and technology, we have never been so plagued with diseases as we are today. And there's never been the threat of diseases such as we are in today. And never has there been a time where we have less to treat such diseases as we do today. Antibiotics are failing us. Most people are becoming uh, resistant to most antibiotics. That's why when you get an infection, the doctor usually ends up giving you two or three prescriptions of antibiotics before it works. And the more you take, then the less you'll be able to, the less effective it'll be the next time you take them, which is the tragedy of it. That's why I don't take a lot of antibiotics because when I really need them, they're gonna work for me. <laughs> and I'm sorry about you. But anyway, Come on, lighten up, okay? This is a praise the Lord day. Some of y'all read the passage and said, oh no, we're in for it today. Uh, but it had to do, you know, a, a time and, and days would be marked by great pestilence and death. And, and, and boy, it certainly it describes this, this ugliness of the day and the, 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 this wounded culture that we live in. The second way this word was used was as a spiritual term. In the gospel, it was this word is used to describe a, a man who had a lot of demons that were active in his life. In Matthew chapter 8, when he referred to, to, the, the, to the maniac of the Gadarenes, when it says he was violent, he was cutting himself. This is the word that was, was used there, was perilous. This man was in a perilous condition. Why was he that way? Because demons were ruling and running and ruining his life. Now, the Bible tells us that the last days are going to be like that for the whole culture. That Satan's going to be having a heyday, in other words. Demons are going to be active on such a level and such a scale that the only way to describe it is it's perilous because of all the demonic activity. And the Bible even tells us when we did our study in apostasy, remember that Peter warned that in the last days, and Paul also warned that these false teachers bring in these damnable heresies, it says in King James. Another one talks about the doctrines of demons will come into the church. This, 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 this idea of, the, of bringing teachings into the, to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that were not truly biblical teachings. Well, you can get that anytime you turn on the radio and listen to a lot of Christian TV. It falls right into that category. A lot of popular doctrines that are popular and accepted and, and lauded and applauded by a lot of people that are just not based in, in truth of God's word. But the third way, which is obviously the way the, the descriptive of the culture we live in, but the third way is this, it was also used to describe an astronomical, uh, it was an astronomical term to describe how uh, the reaction, the violent reaction that takes place when planets or meteors would collide. There'd just be this explosion and this, this collision would take place. Even when a, a meteor hits the earth, it, you know, with the power and the, and, and the, and the violence, and the, you, you've seen these meteors in the holes. I mean, look at the moon. You can see all the meteor craters in the moon that have hit it with such violent force. We're living in that kind of day. We're living in that kind of period. I believe this chronos, these difficult days that, that the scripture prophesied about, you know, thousands of years ago, are the days in which we are presently living. This is the violent term, time. These are difficult days. I mean, look at, even in the context of our culture, one thing that popped out of my mind is, and, and looking at this is just think about how many millions of children have been slaughtered in abortion mills and hospitals, multiples of millions upon millions in our country alone, not counting the billions in the world. Ripped violently, with, suction and forceps and torn apart in pieces, you know, in, in, in these kind of, kind of so-called health centers. We live in difficult times. Three out of six or seven babies is born illegitimate. Untold millions and billions of people are enslaved to drugs and to alcohol. Look at the vast immorality in our culture, and you have to see, boy, if there was ever a term this perilous, this chalepos, that describes the last days and the days that we live in, certainly it describes these perilous times that we are in. I mean, every time you turn on the news, uh, you, you got something like a shooting at the airport in LAX this last week, or you got something like a bombing, or you know, something like the Twin Towers, or, or somebody walking into a theater, or to a school grounds, or on a military base. Every day we seem to hear something, a mother killing her children, children killing their parents. These are violent times. In the last days, perilous, difficult times would come. In fact, when you follow the description of this passage, he lays out 17 characteristics of the last generation, describing just what people will be like in the generation of that, that's the last generation. So what we can do is we can take these 17 terms, 
hold them up against our world and our culture and our life and see, are we near? Are we in those days that are described as the last days, the last generation? And remember, Jesus said, when you see all these things come to pass, then you know that my coming is nigh. And that generation won't fail. Well, let's look at these. And like I said, we'll probably get maybe six or seven of them today. But let's look at the first one. He talks about they are lovers of them own selves. Now, this, this is the Greek word, which is the word philiatos. And it's, it means to be fond of yourself or a lover of your own self above all others. It's made up of two words. And we've used this before uh, in looking, breaking down some words. It, first of all, it's this word, this, this, this first part of it is philo. That's the word we get phileo from. It's the word which has to do with love. It's not agape love. It's a lesser love. It's a brotherly love. The kind of a natural love that you have for, for people. We get the word philanthropist from that. We get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. This is the, the way the word is used in our English language. This is the derivative of philo. He said, but these people not just be philo, they'll not just be brotherly lovers and lovers of their brother, but they're not lovers of brother at all. They're lovers of themselves. This word autos, where we get automobile and automatic, it's a word which really has to do with just self, all right? It's self, basically the word means they love themselves. They're self-centered. The culture that we live in is self-centered. The cry of modern man that has come out of this culture today more than any other time is the whole idea of self-love. It began in the 19th century with, a, with a, the, the apex and, and the, 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 the movings of the humanist movement and the humanist philosophy and the humanist machine where the most important thing is that there is not God, it's man. Man's at the center of his own life. Man is the source of his, his, his own well-being. And man is responsible just to do what he can do to love himself above all else and above all others. It, it, it kind of goes like this. And it began in the schools in the 70s and 60s where, you know, if you just love yourself, you know, if you just love yourself, then you have the capacity to really love others. But if you don't love yourself, then you're really not be able to love others. Now that, I'm trying to think of a nice word. It's ridiculous. Biblically, theologically, that's stupid. How's that one? Is that a good word to describe that? And, but some, some of you think, oh, Brother Joe, but that's, that's, I hear that all the time. You've got to love ourselves. You really have no problem loving yourself. I'm telling you the truth. You love yourself naturally. All right? It's called a sin nature. We put ourselves above others. We put ourselves above God. That's why Jesus said, if any man will come after me, he must love himself. No, he must deny himself. Now, there is an important part we, under, we accept who we are and, and, and re, receive the grace of God in our lives. And it's important, I think, that you know, we understand that we're loved by God and real meaning will not come from me loving myself. Real meaning would discover from coming to under, know, understand and know that God loves me and God has a purpose for my life. And without God, life is meaningless. But now we've moved God over and made ourselves God. And we say, well, you just need to love yourself because out of self-love will flow love for, for others. Well, the more you love yourself, the truth of the matter is the less you love others, not the more you love others. That's why the Bible puts such an important point about you dying to yourself and coming alive to Jesus Christ. We, we have taken God's truth in regard to this principle about self-love and turn the word of God upside down on its head and may basically just, you know, have, have, have made it kind of just, let's not regard that about denying yourself and, you know, turning from yourself and putting yourself and, you know, in, 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 in third, you know, it's, 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 God, it's, it's you first and then, and then maybe God and then others. And, and even though we wouldn't say that, we really believe it. And even in religion, that's where we've come. In the church, in many churches today, the messages will reflect this, this self-love mentality. It will not only go from the, the, the motivational kind of preachers that just, it's all about you. God wants you to feel good. God wants you happy. God wants you blessed. God wants you victories. God wants you in triumph, yada, 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 yada. To, to the other end, well, God wants you healed. God doesn't want any Christian sick. To the other end, of God wants you rich. It's all about you. People go to churches. They, they look for a church home. If you're looking for a church home today, don't get caught in that, that little vacuum that says, oh, what can you do for me? You need to say, God, where can I serve you? What church do you want me in so I can fulfill your call, your destiny, your ministry in my life? Where do, where do you want me today? 
And now we've just completely reversed it all. And all that's important today is, you know, is it due to the roots of this modern infatuation with self-love and humanism. You know, it's all about man and all about, you know, what I want, what can make me happy. You get in a marriage. Oh, he doesn't make me happy, so I'll leave him. She doesn't make me happy, so I'll leave her. That wasn't the deal. The deal was for better or for worse. The deal was till death do us part. The deal was in sickness and in health. That's the deal. That's a covenant relationship, which basically says, I'm not at the center of this. This marriage isn't about me. But what you turn on your daytime TV and you'll find some little talking head say, oh, women, if you really want to discover who you really are, then you've got to, you know, you've got to find time for you. And, you know, you, you know uh, uh, your husband and your children, they just demand far too much from you. And so you need to, you need to focus on you and you need to have you time. I, I get stuff like that. I'm going to take some me time today. That's been the big problem with, for man from the start. What we need is some God time. Amen. What's God want? What's God's will? What's God's word? Quit focusing on me because the more I focus on me, the less happy I am anyway. And the more, but they'll tell you, the more you focus on you, the happier you'll be. The more you can love others. Don't get caught into that humanistic philosophy of living your life or the world centers around you. We tell that to our children. Oh, you're, you're just special and you're the best and you're the greatest and when, when they're really not. When they're disobedient, when they're arrogant, when they're disrespectful. They're not the sweetest little slice of pie on the planet. All right, and they need to know that. Yes, you are special. Yes, you are unique. But you're only going to discover that as you discover God and Christ and his power in your life and you submit and become a, a disciple and a servant of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't come and say, I'm wonderful, look at me. He said, I came to give my life as a ransom. I came not to be served, but to serve. That's the life, but that's not the culture we live in. We're living in this self-loving, and he goes on to say this self-indulgent, they're lovers of silver, or they lovers of money more than they're lovers of God. Jesus used that same principle when he's talking to the Pharisees about they put their wealth and getting things and money far above what they thought about God. Literally, the word here that is translated in this language, covetous is the word here, but it literally means a lover of silver. Doesn't that describe our culture? We love, let me put it this way, lovers of stuff. We love stuff. I got my stuff. You got some stuff. But hey, do you have as much stuff as I've got? And is your stuff as nice as my stuff? I bet it's not. And as long as my stuff is equal or better than your stuff, I'm a happy camper. But should your stuff ever get better than my stuff, we got a problem. I got a problem. I'm not happy. I need more stuff. Right? I mean, I need more stuff. You're not happy. You more. If I have more stuff, I can be, I can be, I can be, I can be good. I'll be all right. I like my stuff. You like your stuff. Hey, in my house, you know, I've got one of those long cabinets in our bathroom. One end down there is my sink <laughs> and my stuff. Every once in a while, Kathy makes the big mistake of getting her stuff down where my stuff is. So you keep your stuff down there with your stuff. This is my stuff. You know what I'm talking about? That's self-indulgence. Don't look at me like that. Some of you look like, a, I got no room for my stuff at all. She's got it all. <laughs> my stuff's under the counter. <laughs> well, get your stuff out. <laughs> Claim your manhood back. This is how immature, how ridiculous. But this is the, the, the age and the day that we're living in, this, this self-indulgent age. And because materialism has such a grip on our life, what suffers? The church suffers. Missions suffer. Souls suffer. Because we forgot what is the most important thing. The Bible says make sure you make the right investments and your investments in the kingdom of God. But if we love stuff... When we love the kingdom stuff, then we're not going to do that. We'll sit and we'll debate how much I'm going to give God or I'm not going to give God. I've got to have my stuff. God's got plenty of stuff, right? He doesn't need me. No, he doesn't, but you need to. Anyway, let's go to number three. You're still with me, right? Self-centered. This is the word he uses, boastful. And by the way, boastful is just an outward evidence of self-love, this self-centeredness. It, it translates from the word alazon, which is a name meaning braggart. In fact, it goes beyond that. This word alazon comes from another word, which comes from the word vagrant. And the idea here, here's somebody who's got nothing but goes around, walks around telling everybody he's got everything. 
Got nothing to brag about, but you brag about everything. It's an assumed arrogance that, that people have in the culture they're living. The boastful translates to meaning brag. Plato defined this as a person who would claim greatness that he does not possess. Boy, just look at politics, you see that, amen? Uh, the politicians, they tell you all the things they can do to change the world and they never get anything done. I think we just need to close it off. Basically, they're, they're, they're trying to deceive people into thinking that they're brilliant or they're special. In fact, this word alazon is only used two times in all the New Testament. One is right here. You know where are the other places? The other place is in Romans chapter one. In Romans chapter one, God is saying very clearly that we are living in a reprobate age. People who don't understand right and wrong because they won't glorify God as God. They put themselves and worship themselves above God. And he said, God, in Romans 1, it says, and therefore God turns them over to this vagrancy, to this alazon. Webster describes this word as one who wanders aimlessly with no visible means of support. <laughs> but I'll tell you, they own the world. What a picture of the humanist. What is a picture of the person who thinks he's arrived when he's not even near? When the person who thinks he's something when he's nothing. Jesus said, beware when you think yourself to be something Beware when you think you're standing, lest you fall. The fourth term is this word for blasphemy. All right? Blasphemous is the, is the description of the age. And it's made of two words, like the, some of these others. It's the word blapto is the first word. Feme is the second word. Bla, blapto, it means, a word, it means to, hinder, to, hint, to, hint, to injure or to hurt, all right? Or even to hinder. So if you put hinder, you get hinder and injure together, right? So you're with me? You know I make up words, and they're all right because they're my words. See, that's... That's some of that vagrancy stuff going on there, right? The injury and the, the harm to hurt. The word fame is the word which we get the word to make something known, to spread about to famous is where we get the word. But these people, you know, they have this act of claiming for themselves in the last generation attributes and powers and authorities that really don't belong to them, but they belong to God. Nobody has a right to tell them what to do. If that's your mindset, nobody has a right to tell you what to do, then this is where you fit. I'm going to let you know, there is someone who has a right to tell you everything to do, and his name is God and Jesus Christ, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, have every right because he's God, because he is who he is to have. He has every right to tell us what to do. And what sin is, ultimately, is the, is the, is the embracing of fame and honor for yourself and just kind of putting God off to the side and elevating yourself as your own Lord and your own King. Self-righteous blasphemers. Those, these are people who defame the name of Christ, but certainly we've seen that in this generation, either from the Ted Turners to Madeline Mary Harris to Bill, uh, uh, what's it, Bill Maher, Bill Maher, who's one of the comedians of the age who loves to defame Christians and, you know, and blaspheme the name of Christ and laugh and mock those who would trust the Bible and believe Jesus Christ from the politicians and the liberals slant today who said, what's wrong with those people who claim to cling to their God and their guns and their Bibles? It's just that you know, we're living in a day when the Christian, now listen to me, this, I'm serious as I can be, Christians are considered to be fools. When you walk out in the world as a whole and say, I believe in Christ, there's going to be some snickers in the room. I'm not talking about candy bars. They're going to laugh. They're going to chuckle under their breath. Just as much as walking to a hospital trying to tell doctors ain't got anything to do with evolution. Oh, you poor fool. Oh, well, you know, poor country bumpkin. Yeah. Well, look at TV. Look at the movies. Unless it's some kind of Christian-produced program, the Christians are looked upon as absolute idiots and fools, or they're, they're always the bad person in the movie. Number five, and I'll stop with this one. After you go to self-righteous, by the dictionary definition, that's the act of claiming for yourself attributes and rights of God. You're not God. There's only one God. Number five, self-ordained. This is the, word, the terminology where he uses here in the King James as well as New American They are disobedient to parents. This is the word apethes. It literally means to be unpersuadable contemptuous, disobedient. It's made up of two Greek words. That one is that negative participle, like ah, which means without, like well, atheist. Theist is someone who believes in God. Ah, atheist is someone who doesn't believe in God. And this is the word ah, pitho. It means literally, it's a primary verb to, to assent, this word pitho, to assent to authority. 
and to respect authority. He said, but you'll be living in the last days in a whole generation of people who have no respect for authority. In fact, the dictionary definition of this word is, is has to do with something, someone who is self-ordained. They've been chosen by themselves rather than by due authority. It's not like someone has given you authority. You just assume you have it. It's like young people in their homes. You say, well, my parents don't tell me what to do anymore. Now, some of you say, I'd never say that out loud, but you live that way. Your parent tells you what you do, but you go do what you want to do anyway. The scriptures are giving a description of the last days, young people, here it is, disobedient parents. What do my parents know? Now, where do they get that from? Well, from the sin nature, but also some of you have let the TV be your babysitters for long, far too long. And you set your children in front of these nighttime, so-called family time, prime time TV shows and these little comic skit shows of family shows where the parents, especially the father and the mother, but they're, they're, per, they're perceived or portrayed as somebody who doesn't have a clue. They are idiots. They don't understand the times they live in. They don't understand the culture. We can mock at them. We can make jokes about them. We can laugh at them. This is the qualification that we're talking about in scriptures that describe what it means to be an end time person without Christ. They're disobedient to authorities. I don't have to listen to the policeman. I don't have to listen to the government. I don't have to listen to prescribed authorities because I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. I don't care what they say. And this is the interesting word that's using this apitho. Uh, it literally means unpliable and bullheaded and wrong, and won't hear the truth, stubbornly resisting. You know, I have rights. Let me tell you, listen carefully. You earn rights. Amen. You earn rights. You don't have rights. You earn rights. As you grow, as you mature, as you do the right thing, as you make the right choices, you earn rights. But we're living in a culture where parents have let the, the government tell them in some regards of what is right and wrong instead of the Bible telling them what's right and wrong. We always submit to authorities, even governmental authorities, as long as they're not in opposition to God's authority. Yes. But what we've done is we've let the government be the final authority and not the word of God be the final authority. Listen to this in Deuteronomy when, when, when God's warning the children of Israel what would happen if they get to this place where they reject his authority and they deny it. It says in Deuteronomy 28, 30, he talks about the curse of children. He says, your sons and your daughters shall be given unto another people and your eyes will look and fail with longing for them. What's he saying here? Because you didn't do what you should have done as a parent, your children are gonna follow other people. They're gonna to listen to other people. They're gonna to listen to what the professor said, the teacher said. They're gonna to listen to what the TV said, what the Hollywood industry said, what the producers of pornography said. They're gonna follow that route and not follow your route. We have a whole nation of parents who sit helplessly by watching the drugs, the occult, the TV, alcohol swallow up their children. What's happened? What's gone wrong is the cry. They never chose to what was right. Deuteronomy 28 says this, they shall beget sons and daughters, but they shall not enjoy them. What a tragedy. It's also in Romans 1, we talked about those signs of being that reprobate person who denies God. It says in Romans 1.30, they're backbiters, they're haters of God, they're despiteful, they're proud, they're boasters, they're inventors of evil things, and they're disobedient to parents. So before you run, tell your frolicking friends that you're really getting away with something your parents don't have any idea and they wouldn't approve of it because they're stupid. Or they don't know, or they're outdated, or they're old-fashioned. You might consider what the Bible has to say about people who are like that. It's a caution sign. It's a warning sign. But it's also a sign of what the days would be like just before the return of Christ. We preached that whole message on apostasy in that series. What did we see? We saw people in the church who denied God's rightful place to be God over their lives and just invented their own doctrines and their own ideas and their own philosophies. And we're living today in a world where our young people are getting pretty much out of control because they will not respond to authority, much less their parents' authority. Disobedient to parents. It's a dangerous route to go, but it is the route in which the popular culture will follow according to scripture. The people reject God's authority. They reject parental authority. Nobody has the right to tell me what I can do, what I can't do. I'll do what I want to do. Left to yourself, you'll destroy yourself. Surrender to God's rights, God's will, and God's purposes over your life. 
See what God does in your life. It's as different as day and night. I would choose to follow light instead of darkness. Would you stand with your heads bowed? We'll look at some of the rest of this next week. But I want us to take a moment before the Lord with our heads bowed.